people get an opportunity to, to become a building inspector or even a permit technician or plans examiner or even a building official. I mean, they have resources. They have a channel that they can access that's going to uh, provide them with a basic understanding of the development process and building services, right? Um, a great mentor of mine, Wendell Montes, what I just mentioned, once said, sometimes you got to take a step back to take a huge leap forward. And thank you for tuning in. This video follows the foundation and slab inspection requirements. And in this video, I will cover the underfloor framing inspection requirements for residential structures. Please keep in mind that this video does not cover every possible scenario, but it does cover basic fundamentals, including code references, and it should help set the basis for the inspection presented. So let's get started. I will first cover some common general requirements. First, Always be sure the official approved plans are on site for all inspections and ensure the work is done to the approved plans. And before scheduling the inspection, be sure all prior inspections or partial prior inspections are completed and signed off, that is underground utilities and foundation footings inspections. This is to assure there are no setbacks later in the inspection phases related to unsigned inspections or incompleted inspections. Segwaying now to the floor framing requirements. If constructing the raised floor framing with manufactured eye joists, be sure to follow the manufacturer's guidelines as it relates to blocking, web stiffeners, crush blocks, hangers, cutting, and notching. All metal hardware specified on the approved plans must be installed. For example, 835 clips, L clips, straps, post spaces, post caps, and hangers. The underfloor framing construction must be naturally durable wood or preservative treated wood. However, non-treated conventional materials may be used providing that wood framing and sill plates are no less than 8 inches above finished grade. Floor joists must have at least 18 inches clearance to expose ground. Girders must have at least 12 inches clearance to expose ground. And girder ends entering masonry or concrete walls must have clearances of not less than half an inch on top, sides, and ends. Nails, anchor bolts, and washers in contact with treated wood must be galvanized. The exception to the rule is half-inch diameter or greater steel bolts. Inspectors verify that a minimum of two anchor bolts are installed per mudsill plate, with one bolt located no more than 12 inches or less than seven bolt diameters from each end of the mudsill plate section. Mud sill plates shall be anchored with a minimum half inch diameter anchor bolts spaced no greater than six foot on center. Three by three inch square washers are required on anchor bolts. Also note that alternative anchors or straps that are equivalent to half inch diameter anchor bolts are acceptable. Where treated mud sills are cut or drilled, be sure to treat the areas with copper naphthenate. Underfloor posts shall have post caps and bases or approved connectors. This is to ensure against lateral and uplift displacement. Proper ventilation of underfloor areas helps get rid of damp air and allows for fresh air to enter the space. And as a result, it prevents fungi growth. That said, the minimum net area of ventilation must be one square foot for each 150 square foot. However, Vent openings may be one square foot for each 1,500 square foot of underfloor area if the underfloor ground surface is covered by class one vapor retarder. This video shows a prime example of this exception. Notice the vapor retarder installed. This allowed for the reduction of the vent openings to the underfloor area as per the exception. In any event, one such opening shall be within 36 inches of each building corner. An access must be provided to all underfloor spaces, and openings shall be a minimum of 18 inches by 24 inches when located through the floor, and 16 inches by 24 inches when located on a perimeter wall. Please note that access openings shall not be located under a door to the residence. And prior to the building final, the underfloor area must be free of all vegetation, 
wood forms, and construction materials. So be sure this is done as the project progresses. Moving on to underfloor utilities, starting with the underfloor plumbing. Approved pipe materials will be verified during this inspection, and waste piping systems must be completed and on a 10-foot head of water test. All piping systems must be adequately supported, and since horizontal drains rely on gravity for the movement of flow, horizontal drainage piping shall be installed with a slope of not less than a quarter inch per foot. However, piping four inches and larger in diameter may have a slope of one-eighth inch per foot were first approved by the local building department. Changes in direction and drainage systems are critical for the proper flow of liquids and solids. Building inspectors verify vertical drainage lines connecting to horizontal drainage lines entered through 45 degree Y branches or other approved fittings of equivalent sweep. Horizontal drainage lines connecting with other horizontal drainage lines must enter through 45 degree Y branches or other approved fittings of equivalent sweep. If applicable, verify backwater valve requirements. This applies where fixtures are installed below the next upstream manhole cover. In such scenarios, the installation of a backwater valve is required. For ease of access, plumbing cleanouts are required to extend to the outside of the building, above the floor, or within five feet of an underfloor access. Please note that additional cleanouts are required for each aggregate horizontal change of direction exceeding 135 degrees. Moving on to gas piping. Building inspectors verify the gas pipe size and types are per the official approved plan. And building inspectors also verify that all gas piping systems are adequately supported. Except that corrugated stainless steel pipe must be supported in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications and gas pipe must be tested at 10 PSI for 15 minutes minimum with a gauge of 1 PSI increments. It is important to note that typically the gas piping is once again tested at the drywall inspection. Water piping must also be properly supported. And during this inspection, the building inspector verifies the water pipe size and types as per the official approved plan. For a list of approved materials, please reference the plumbing code. If copper pipe is used, it must be a minimum of type M, and type M copper pipe is identified by a red mark. And here are other types of copper pipes with their identifiers, such as type L marked in blue, which is thicker than type M, type K, which is marked in green and is thicker than both type L and type M copper pipe. Water piping must be tested with air or water at a minimum of 50 PSI for no less than 15 minutes. And once again, please note that plastic pipe shall not be tested with air. And here is an example of why most sewer and water plastic pipes are not allowed to be tested with air. And finally, the underfloor mechanical inspection, where building inspectors verify the duct size, and types as per the approved plan and energy compliance forms. Ensure proper clearances are maintained of four inches from earth to metal and flexible ducts. Flexible air ducts are one of the most commonly installed ducts in residential projects, and here are some requirements building inspectors verify. Flex air ducts must be supported horizontally at every four feet. Sags between support hangers shall not exceed half an inch per foot of support spacing. Support shall be rigid and shall be no less than one and a half inches wide at point of contact with the duct surface. Duct bends shall not be less than one duct diameter bend radius. Furnaces installed under floor must be on a concrete slab not less than three inch above ground. If the furnace is supported from the floor framing, Six inches of clearance is required from the furnace to the ground. A fire sprinkler head is typically required to be installed above furnaces installed in crawl spaces. This is a good time to mention this to the installer, but consult with the agency's fire department for specifics. Building inspectors also verify that a light and a receptacle outlet are installed near the appliance, and the switch shall be located at the entrance of the passageway to the furnace. And finally, 
to verify the installation R values of the ducts installed. Here's an example of where you will find the R values for mechanical ducts. This concludes the underfloor framing requirements, and I hope it has been of help to you. Stay tuned for roof sheathing and exterior shear inspection requirements as we continue down the sequence of the inspections for residential buildings.